just finished the book of Exodus. I mean the book of Genesis, right? In Hebrew, the title for the book of Genesis is Bereshit. Bereshit means in the beginning. And the custom amongst the Jews, when they would name their books of their Bible, they would name them after the first phrase, the first words that start the book. They didn't have titles, they didn't have chapters, they just had scrolls, and they say, get the book of the beginnings, Bereshit. Well, today, we're going to open up the book of the names. What Aleph Shemoth, Shem being the names. These are the names from the first verse out of Exodus chapter 1. Now, these are the names. And when he called our names, we ran out of the grave. Look at... If you're in Exodus chapter 1, Genesis 50, verse 26. If you were with us as we finished up the book of Genesis, this will bring to mind something. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. That is where we ended in the book of Genesis. In a coffin in Egypt. And as I mentioned, uh, about 400 years later is where we pick up with verse 1 of Exodus. I want to read to you out of Genesis 15 the prophecy that God gave to Abraham concerning this 400 year gap of time between the last verse of Genesis and the first verse of Exodus. In Genesis 15, at verse 13, God is making a covenant with Abraham. It's night, sun goes down, they cut these birds they, and animals, they split the carcasses apart, and a torch goes walking up between these in the dark. And we read, it says in verse 13, Then he, God, said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God brought Abraham into this land, this land that he promised to give Abraham. We call it the promised land. But then the descendants of Abraham, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashores, would leave the promised land. As we just finished the last couple of chapters of Genesis, during a famine, Jacob, through his son Joseph, were saved from the famine, they all moved down to the land of Goshen. Seventy in all, we read. And then there's this 400-year gap that we just read about. Two reasons for this 400-year gap between Genesis and Exodus. One of them we just read, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God fully intended to judge the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Of Canaan. The Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all these different people who were wicked and immoral, and he was waiting for that point with warning and opportunity to turn and repent over and over again. He says, there's going to come a time when it's full, and I'm going to judge them. So not only was he waiting for the iniquity to be full, but in that time he took the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, out of circulation and out of that cesspool of wickedness and brought them down to a land of Goshen where they prospered and grew exceedingly. Then they will be God's instruments to bring judgment upon those wicked inhabitants of the land of Canaan. So he was protecting and preserving and increasing, prospering Israel at the same time waiting for the moment when he would use them to come back in and cleanse the promised land and give them that inheritance. So that's been going on behind the scenes. 
And this is just a weird, maybe quirky, morbid little Mike-ism. But if you're paying close attention for 400 years, and then 40 years in the wilderness, and then coming into the promised land, we know that there was all the children of Israel and their flocks. There was the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God, Shekinah glory at the tabernacle of meeting, the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, and a coffin. They carried Joseph with them that whole time. Okay? We'll see in, Je in Joshua 24 how he comes home to be buried in the place he, he re 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 would request. That's just so bizarre in a little way. I know it's kind of bizarre, but you don't notice that. But he called my name. Well, Eleth Shemoth, the names. These are the names he called. So um, I'm going to pick up here at verse 1. Now, now is a, a version of the word and, especially in the Hebrew. So the story picks right up where verse 26 of chapter 50 left. And we're continuing. And these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, each man and his household came with Jacob. Those who came with him. This is where we get the name for the book that we use in the English, Exodus. It literally has to do with exiting, leaving, departing. If you look in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, and then in 2 Peter 1, 15, we see that word used in the Greek uh, in Luke 9 where Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter and John and James are up on the mountain and they notice that he's talking to these two guys, Elijah and Moses in white. And what are they discussing? They're, they're discussing Jesus' departure, his soon upcoming crucifixion, burial, Resurrection and ascension, departure to he heaven. And that is the Greek word exodus. And then again, in Peter, 2 Peter 1.15, he says, I make it a point that I leave you a record of the things that I have witnessed because I must soon exodus. I must soon depart this earth. Okay? So the book is really about going out, departing, leaving. But I do want to bring to note the first line, God is interested in who is leaving and who is going. It's not as much about the event, but the people that are part of it. And so we get this list. And it's a great way if you're trying to find a place in your Bible, you can get the list of the tribes of Israel. Here's a good list, okay? Verse 2, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, when you get into Acts chapter 7, uh, in verses 9 through 19, in fact, I'll take you there right now, Stephen talks about this event when he is giving his defense before the Sanhedrin, the high Jewish Supreme Court. This, this trial that he's in will end with his execution. He'll be stoned to death. But in the meantime, he's just shooting straight with them, and we're going to bounce back and forth into the book of Acts because a lot of information that we're going to read today is here. And I always encourage people, the New Testament is your very best commentary on the Old Testament. If you're trying to understand the Old Testament, see what you can dig up in the New Testament because there you will get the Holy, Inspir Holy Spirit inspired version of commentary. And so at verse 9, in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen begins saying, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his troubles, and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. 
So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So these are all things you're very familiar with when you just finish the book of Genesis with me. One thing you might not be familiar with is here we talk about 75 people, whereas uh, in uh, the book of Exodus here it talks about 70. And what Stephen has done is just counted Joseph, his wife, and his kids. And so it just changes the number a little bit. It's not, not anything to get too concerned about. Okay, so we've got all these people now, and uh, they are where we left them, in Egypt. Okay? Um, and Joseph died, and all his brethren, all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and grew and multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Okay? So this is what's going on. God is prospering them. God is increasing them. Just as he told Abraham, it's the sand of the seashore, it's the stars in heaven. And it's kind of interesting. You start with 70 people 400 years earlier. Um, and then when we get into the book of Numbers, which follows this, and uh, Leviticus Numbers, where they start walking across the wilderness, it's going to note that there were 603,550 men. That was, the, that was the census in the book of Numbers. You want to guess what the book of Numbers is about? Numbers. <laughs> the numbers, how many people there were, okay? And it starts with that many men, but it doesn't include wives, and it doesn't include children. And that many men are men of, uh, of uh, age to be in war, to go out to battle, which according to the Bible was between 20 and 50 years of age. So that it doesn't count the 19 and others, and it doesn't count the 60 and over men and it doesn't count wives and children, and a reasonable estimate, without really stretching it too hard, starts pushing the number of people that went from 70 over 400 years to just shy of 3 million. That would just be uh, regular math. Uh, kind of interesting as the population is increasing during this time. Um, if you were just to take 70 and double it uh, every 25 years, every generation, you'd come to about 3 million. That's not hard math, right? Just every, every generation, they double in number, right? Mom and dad, they have two kids, bam. There you go, 3 million. So, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now remember, this is... 400 years since the time of Joseph, right? So there's been many dynasties that have come into play. I've got this list that I've written down in my Bible. I'm not going to bore you with it, but all the different 29 dynasties of the European, or the European, the Egyptians, right? From the third and sixth dynasty that built the pyramids, uh, moving on all the way up to the dates that we're at here. But this probably would have been Tutmose III in about B.C., or before Christ, 1504 to 1450, right in that area. So Tutmos is this king. A new king arose, uh, and there arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Okay, so they've outstripped them in population. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Kind of interesting in all of that. This was probably Seti the first, and at this time, he got involved with uh, the Hittites, and he got involved with some uh, skirmishes with the Hittites, um, and as things kind of rolled around, um, it was about 1446 that the Egyptians lost power and lost their war with uh, some of these parties. And that's the same time when the children leave the land of uh, Egypt, the children of Israel. So we, we, wanna, we need to deal shrewdly with them. Therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted and the more they multiplied and grew, and they <clears throat> were in dread of the children of Israel. 
Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so the more they, they pushed them, the, the more that they had babies, okay? <laughs> now, kind of interesting in all of that, archaeologically they've gone back through the ruins and they've noticed, now they weren't building the pyramids, those were built long before them, but they were building these storehouses and these cities uh, in Pithom and Ramesses. But when they go through and do excavations, it's at this time, as they're going through the layers of sediment, that they start noticing straw being mingled with the brick. Prior to that, there wasn't as much straw being mingled with the brick. And uh, then they start seeing less and less straw as they go up, because remember, they started making them collect their own straw and so it was harder for them to get bricks but this is all archaeologically verified okay kind of interesting cool stuff if you dig a little deeper it says so the egyptians made the children of israel serve with rigor or harsh treatment and any of you have grown up and seen one of these prince of egypt type movies or uh, the ten commandments with charlton heston and the way they treat them badly that's that's fundamentally a depiction of what it was in order to keep them from rising up and taking over, they really pushed them down um, into a, a position of slavery. <clears throat> it says, um, verse 14, uh, And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, all manner of service in the field, and their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. A couple fun little stories in this, but you probably know about this. Uh, it happened in the New England coast, the oyster... Uh, Fishermen, farmers, I don't know what you call an oyster farmer, okay? But they would have problems because starfish love oysters. And they were having a problem with the starfish killing the oysters. And so, as they would gather these oysters, quite often they would get starfish. And because of their disdain, their hatred for the starfish, whenever one came on board, they would take their knife and just cut it up in a lot of pieces and throw it overboard because they hated the starfish. Well, little known fact, starfish can grow a whole new starfish out of one leg. <laughs> so in trying to destroy the starfish, what they did is they just made it explode, okay? And it was a hard lesson learned. That's what's happening to the children of Israel not right now with, with these. Another interesting thing, you know, in China, there was a time where Christians were free to preach in China and be missionaries to China. Uh, a lady by the name of Lauren uh, Sonnenberg, who was one of the founders of Desert uh, Hot, is Desert, Desert, or Sky Valley Desert Conference Desert. Center, Desert Training Center <coughs> in Desert Hot Springs. Uh, Gary knows her. Were they your pa pastor or pastor's parents? We were married by uh, Bruce Sonnenberg. Bur Bruce Sonnenberg. Lauren was the last American missionary to get out of China before they shut the bamboo curtain down and people couldn't get in and at the time when she left they had succeeded in building a church of about 50,000 people in China which is a lot but when you consider how many million actually over a billion Chinese there wasn't that much but then through ping-pong diplomacy and Nixon and the curtain started parting we got back in when they went back in they, were, they found over 150 million Christians in China. From 50,000 when they shut everything down and kicked the missionaries out, and we got back in and it had blossomed to over 150 million. And this is one of the funny things about it, I think, is that they would take these Christians, especially the pastors, and to punish them, they would put them in jail. And so what ended up happening is jails became <laughs> seminaries. And all the people were converted to Christianity in the jails. And then they didn't want them to go back to the communities where they took them from, so they spread them all over the country to be rural post office, postmasters delivering the mail. That's, those are just funny things. But that's what's happening here, right? They're just growing in numbers no matter how hard they oppress them. Okay, so verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua, and he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, 
If it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. And so we've got this new thing, and this is um, during the reign of Amenhotep II. And he's this guy, and this is their strategy. Not too much different from China, right? And the one-child policy and that kind of thing. All these things that if they had read their Bible, which they wouldn't read their Bible, but had they read their Bible, they would know that's not a good pro program. It don't work. Um, but they decided, we'll just kill the males. We're not worried about the women rising up in revolt against us and taking over the country. But the men, we need, to, we need to whittle those numbers out. So whenever a male child is born, you Hebrew midwives, you just take that child and, and kill it. Um, it says, but. I love the buts, and there's a lot of them in here. Uh, but God, right? But the midwives feared God. Okay? Their first concern was what is Yahweh God going to say and do about this and did not do so as the king of Egypt commanded them but saved the male children alive okay and just as I mentioned before we started today uh, the Meridian Planned Parenthood shut down this week the Boise Planned Parenthood shut down a couple weeks ago and uh, we're looking at Twin Falls I'm sure if it hasn't it's soon to close its door and Abortion will no longer be allowed in the state. Now, um, without, I'm painting with a broad brush here, okay? And, and there's a lot that's going to go through the courts and how this all plays out. But at the end of the day, just the wanton, just destruction of innocent human lives to satisfy the convenience and sexual urges of a bunch of people that don't want somebody telling them what to do. Um, that stops. That doesn't happen here anymore. Um, it's interesting. Since Roe v. Wade in 1973, there have been 60 million babies aborted. To put that in perspective, 60 million people in 1973, that's 50 years, basically, 49 years. Since that time, uh, we could have had a nation the size of France, that's 60 million people, the United Kingdom, Spain, or South Korea. Even Canada, to our north, is only 38,000 people. So that's how many people we are less than we would have been as a nation had Roe v. Wade not gone on the books. You know, And I'm not trying to get political, per se, but we're told that there's a labor shortage, and the answer is to open the borders and just let people flood in. How about not killing your own citizens? There's an idea, okay? Again, I don't, I'm not trying to make that political, but it's germane to what we're doing here. These things don't change. The truth is always the truth and always will be the truth. And if we'll just pay close attention, we can profit from this. Okay, verse 18. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwife said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. <laughs> uh, okay, as much as that might sound cute or, or whatever, the Hebrew race, if you will, somehow is just, just better at getting her done. And uh, we can't get there in time. And so uh, that's, that's, our, that's our answer. The truth is, the answer is a lie. And look what happens. These midwives lie. Um, verse 20, therefore God dwelt well with the midwives. Now, I bring that up and I couched it that way because it kind of begs the question, is it okay to lie? What do you think? Uh, it's going to be 19 chapters before the Ten Commandments, so thou shalt not lie is not there yet. <laughs> the, is it or isn't it? I mean, these are questions we have to deal with. I mean, you can come on Wednesday night and listen to a story in Exodus and go, wow, that's cool, God's so great. But what about us? And what about when we come to that point where the Pharaoh says, kill your babies? What do you do? You don't, okay? There's a lot of places a person could go with this. Uh, Romans 13.1 talks about 
obeying your government. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 3 talks about obeying your government. Acts 4, 19. Acts 5, 29. Just read a couple of these. Acts 5, uh, 28 and through 32. They forbid them from preaching in the name of Jesus. It, it says in Acts 5, 28, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? That's the name of Jesus. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. These Hebrew midwives feared God. And ultimately, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is everlasting life. It starts with the fear of God. If you start on a different foot, you start on a different foundation, you're never going to come to the truth. You've got to start with the fear of God. In 1 Peter, and remember, Peter was writing uh, in a time when Nero was on the throne. He's insane. He makes our president look pretty mild. Really? That's how bad Nero was, okay? But this is what we read in 1 Peter in chapter 2, at verse 13 and following. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. So here it is right here. Here's your answer. That by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. He finishes up, honor all people, love the brotherhood, <coughs> fear God, honor the king. And even in his list, fear God comes first. That foolish men might be put to shame. Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. When you're dealing with godless people, irreverent people, people who do not fear God, or the will of God, or the way of God, we must choose the way of God. And then allow the chips to fall where they may. One of the things I love uh, about Bart Martin Luther King, if you've ever read a letter from the Birmingham jail, it's a fantastic civil rights piece, but in jail for marching for civil rights, he writes about the need for civil disobedience. Okay? That when the laws are wrong, we must not do them. But, and this is the brilliance in the letter to the Birmingham jail, he says, and then you must be prepared to face the consequences. They throw you in jail, they throw you in jail. You th they throw you in a furnace and turn the heat up seven times. You walk on in. Just know that we will not bow to you. We bow to God. Okay? So, that's not necessarily the clear black and white definition of is it okay to lie. But what they're doing is saving innocent human lives from wicked people. And it says, and God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew just exactly what the Egyptians didn't want, very mighty. That means influence, power. They were uh, a threat to the uh, Egyptians. Verse 21, you've got to love this verse. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. If you want to break that down, what that says is they started having babies too. See, typically the midwives were the barren women in society. They couldn't produce children, but they could certainly help with raising the children and, and going through all these things. And all of a sudden, now all these women that normally didn't have to have kids or could, didn't get to have kids, now they're having kids too. So, just to put a little cherry on top, okay? Verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So that's kind of a summary, summary statement. I should say in here, and uh, if you go to the grammar, what it is saying is, So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born 
to the Hebrews. That's implied, okay? That's inferred in the grammar. So not just all the children of Egypt, obviously, but to the Hebrews. Full-on racism, if you've ever seen racism, just flaming, bright, loud, and proud. And not just racism, but a very pernicious form of racism that has been with us since the Garden of Eden, and it's anti-Semitism. It's a hatred of the Jewish people. It's a hatred of the people of God. And when you look about all the different wars and, and that have gone on for, for uh, political, nation-building, economy reasons, whatever, religious reasons, all the different racial wars that have gone on in history, they've all been fought and won and somebody lost and they licked their wounds and society went on with the exception of one. The first one, which has never stopped, it's the hatred of the Jews because it is demonic. All, all racism is roots in, in Satan, but this one just comes straight from the pit of hell. There is no reason why one people group should be targeted specifically, relentlessly, through all of human history. But Satan believes that if he can cancel the Jews, he can thwart God's plans to save the world through a Jewish Messiah. And the Bible teaches that all Jews, those who come into the tribulation and do confess, that is our son, the one whom we pierced. When they recognize Jesus as their Messiah, they will be saved. But if... Satan can wipe out the Jews, he can make God a liar. And so he's doing everything in his power to kill them. And this is a classic example right here of all that going on. We're going to see it again come up. Well, we're not going to see it because we're in the book of Luke now. We saw it just recently in the book of Matthew. Herod killing all the babies, the innocents, when he was trying to wipe out Jesus. It's just, it's wicked, okay? And so this is, this is the stage. It's being set. The names and the departure, and, and it's all building. Let's see. Okay, I meant to go through for chapter 2, and we're going to see what we can do here. Okay. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. What can you tell me about Levi? Anybody? Priest. Priest, Priest okay. He's the one that's set aside. Doesn't get an inheritance, does he? His inheritance will be the Lord, the portion of the Lord's. And they will serve in these 48 communities scattered throughout the promised land whenever they get there. But in the meantime, uh, Levi does not get a favorable blessing. In fact, along with Simeon, he gets a pretty heavy curse. We just read that just a week or so <coughs> back, right? And, uh, but this is Levi. And now these are descendants of, of Levi. Um, so the woman, conceived, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Okay, uh, This is all about um, uh, Jochebed. We're going we're gonna to introduce to uh, these two people. Amram is the husband, Jochebed is the wife. And when Jochebed saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Now, that's possible in the first three months of, uh, of a child being born, to hide them. Why, why would that be? Why is it easier then than later on? Anybody? Yeah? Because they can uh, just get thrust back. They they, don't yeah. Them. And if, it, if you've ever they noticed, quite often, well, I heard it. They still cry. They cry, but they don't, a lot of them don't cry much at all. Mm -hmm. Those first three months, I mean, they will. I, I, I know, you're all saying, oh, Mike, you don't know what you're talking about. But if you've been around a lot of babies, when they're brand new baby infants, a lot of times they're quite quiet. And you're thinking, wow, I got a winner. And then four months hit, and you're like, what happened to my baby? <laughs> so she hit him for three months, it's, and, and it says he was a beautiful child. No ordinary child. The word beautiful there is the word tob, T-O-B. Um, it's pleasing, it's good, it's happy. Gracious, charming, lovely, lovely. Um, uh, the the Hebrew name that uh, incorporates that is the name Tobiah, 
or Tobias, okay? Beautiful, okay? And so this is a beautiful boy, okay? This would be about, if you do notes, pretty close to 1526 B.C. If you want to celebrate this little baby's birthday, it comes around 1526 B.C. I'll get into some of the math on that in a couple more weeks probably to kind of help you get there. But that would be the birth of this baby. Verse 3, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Okay? Huge step of faith. Talking about steps of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, Holy Spirit inspired commentary. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of of the king's command by faith okay and sometimes that's what it's going to require us is to look and, and step out in faith in these situations even if it's not politically correct even if it's not culturally cool even if the world is saying to go one way or don't do that we have to figure out what it is that is right and do it anyways do what is right come what may you do what do you, you do what's right, let the chips fall where they may, and let God have the answer, okay? And, and in some cases, it, it may turn out really bad for you in a temporal, physical, worldly sense. Many Christians, having lived their faith, died their faith. We call them martyrs. The word martyr, martos, from the... Greek is just the witness. Your life is a witness of what you believe, what your faith is, who you fear, who you trust, who you love. And if you live that way, you, the, the natural default setting is you die that way. If you're just a creep and you live that way, guess what? You die a creep. But if you are a witness, if you are a martus, a martyr, you're going to live that beautiful life, and you will be testimony to Jesus, just as Stephen was. We talked about him earlier. Great step of faith. Verse 4, and this is a fun little piece right here. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Pop quiz, what's her name? Um, Miriam. Miriam, okay. I just thought I'd see. You know, it's not, we haven't seen it yet, so you might not know, but that's Miriam. This is his big sister. His sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. I love that. Tears are powerful. Tears can really move you, right? What is that new word we've got? Uh, uh, a cry bully? You know, you've probably heard of cry babies, but a cry bully, somebody that uses their tears to bully you into submission, right? I don't think Moses was a cry bully. He was just a baby crying, okay? But it moved Pharaoh's daughter's heart, right? Um, it says, verse 7, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, remember, she's been watching from off in the weeds, or the reeds, I should say. Uh, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go! So the maiden went and called the child's mother. This is Jochebed. This is Moses' mom, right? Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. <laughs> yeah! Woo! That's like, that's a total Jesus story right there. Let me tell you about my Jesus, okay? They have this law on the land that i got to kill my babies. But by faith, there was a beautiful child, and we kept that baby. But the day came where I had to trust God with him. So we created this little ark, this boat, this raft out of reeds, and we put him in it. And Oh, man, you can imagine the, the heartache. And we put him in the river, and he started drifting away. Our little daughter, she followed to see what would become of him. And all of a sudden... Pharaoh's daughter 
reaches in and picks him up and she's moved with compassion. And so I just say, hey, can I get you a nurse? And she says, sure. In fact, I'll pay her for it. And goes and gets mom. And mom gets to raise Moses, nurse him, and gets paid for it. In light of the king's command to kill all the babies. Right? That's how God works. It's just beautiful in all of these things. Uh, so the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. So she called his name Moses, mm -hmm. saying, because I drew him out of the water. Uh, Mesa is that word for drawn out. Moshe is the Hebrew version of that. To be drawn out. You might just nickname him Drew. Okay? Um, he's the first Baptist in the Bible out of Egypt. Um, you can boo. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but in all this, this comes out. I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 7 again. This is, um, I should have taken you to Acts chapter 7 earlier. I'm going to go to back to verse 23 and read on through a chunk of it here now. Um, now, no, not 23. I'm sorry. 20 and 22. I had it right before. Okay. Uh, at this time, Moses was born, and he was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was sent, set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So he got a front row education. He, had, he was raised with a silver spoon. I can't tell you how many times we saw kids adopted in the Philippines. And we take these kids, and sometimes they're literally infants, and they can be found abandoned on the beach, uh, abandoned in fields, just covered with uh, ants or in trash cans. And they come to us, and we, we, we um, process them for adoption. And they get adopted all over the planet, to Australia or Spain or England or North Dakota or wherever, all around the planet. And I can't tell you how many times these kids would be adopted by, like, bazillionaires. Or just, they, they get adopted into like royal family type things. And you're looking, and I'm like, man, that'd be nice. You know, it's like, wow, right? That's what happened to Moses here, right? Um, from the gutter to the, the, the castle. Uh, fantastic story here. Um, verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens and I'm just going to uh, read to you really quick out of Hebrews 11, again, out of the Hall of Faith, picking up at verse 24 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Now there's a lot in that that I don't want to chew on too hard tonight. One of them is, and it just blows my mind, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than riches. How does Moses know about the reproach of Christ? Okay, that how spitefully Jesus would be treated by the world that chew him up, spit him out, basically crucified him and buried him. And yet Moses chose that way, the way of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on up through all that God had taught them, somehow Jochebed and um, uh, Amram wrote, raised that boy right. They, they instilled into him a love and a fear, a respect, a worship for Yahweh God, and the things of God, and doing things God's way. And when he became of age, and we're going to see in another place here shortly, that he was 40 years old at this point. Okay, And now it's time for him to make his own way in life. And he says, you know what? I'm going to forsake all of that to be with my people. Not too different from what we ask of people who have to leave their families and their families' religion and their family's way of doing things. A lot of times when we share Jesus Christ with people, it means everything that they have is probably going to be destroyed. Their business, their friendships, and everything like that. 
And yet we see it done over and over in our community. That's the price that Moses paid, and that's the price that God actually asks all of us to pray, pay, to be willing to deny ourselves, lay everything down, pick up the cross, and follow him. And uh, so this is what Moses is doing. Um, it says, it came, I'm back at Exodus 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And so he saw all the, the rigor, all the shrewd dealings that they were, they were um, suffering under. And he looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Okay? He smote him, right? He killed him. He beat him. He struck him. Naka is the word. And it's that word that thou shall not kill. Okay? Back in Genesis, when they came off the ark, remember we read in Genesis 6, at verse... Uh, I'm sorry, verse, Genesis 9, at verse 5. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For the, in, in the image of God he made man. Okay? So this is already in the books. You can't say, well, I hadn't written the Ten Commandments yet, or copied them down, or brought them off the mountain. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to kill. That's been around forever. And here it says he looked one way, and he looked another, and then he smote him. He didn't look up. He, he didn't look every which way, and God saw him, and God was watching. And he did have to pay for that. But he paid through Jesus Christ. Okay? He had to wait for 2,500 years. No, 3,500 years for Christ to bury that debt. But he did. And it's interesting that we do see Moses in the promised land talking with Jesus prior to his crucifixion. And then I believe he's one of the two witnesses we find in the book of Revelation um, at the last days. But his debt will have to be settled. There will have to be a, 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 an evening or a reckoning for that. It says in, um, oh, James 1, 19 through 20, uh, kind of a good verse if you have issues with anger management uh, and those kinds of things. It's, uh, James writes, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Okay? And that's what Moses did. In his wrath, he tried to settle the score, and uh, it's, going to, it's going to cost him dearly. Um, he went and hid, hid, hid him in the sand. Verse 13, When he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting, and he said to one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Well, he was. He was like the son of Pharaoh, okay? <laughs> but... That's their answer. You want to act like us. What makes you think you're, you're, you can judge us, okay? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And we can be certain. In the book of Numbers it says, be sure. Your sin will find you out. Okay? If it's coming out, the best thing to do is confess it. Get it out in the open before anybody can use it against you. And just let God forgive you for it. That's the way you deal with it, okay? We all sin, but if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us our sin and forgive us as all righteousness. For he's the propitiation. He's the one that paid it for it, right? But he wants credit for what he did, okay? It'd be like some going to a, a restaurant. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you get up to pay and you find out the couple at the other table paid your bill? Can you imagine how stupid it would be to try to pay it anyway? Mm -hmm. It's already been paid. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine how ungracious it would be when you see those people the next time, 
not to say thank you. You know, and that's how we, conf we confess our sins. God, I am so sorry. I know this is one of those things you died for, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And he goes, no problem. That's why I did it. Love it that we're talking. Love it that we're, we're coming clean and all that. But anyways, this is where he's at in this. Um, verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. Pharaoh's reputation is on the line too. He has to be just. Even though he's a high muckety-muck, right? That um, if he doesn't kill him, then that brings into question everything else Pharaoh does. So, uh, heard this, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down at a well. I want to take us really quickly back to Stephen, book of Acts, verses 23 through 29 of chapter 7, and a little more commentary on this. Um, here we go. Now, when he was 40 years old, so that's how old we know he was when this happened, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Okay? Mm -hmm. he, he, he assumed they must know, I'm, I'm your deliverer. But they didn't know that. They didn't get that. Um, and the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want me to kill? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. I'm going to keep on reading, and then we're going to read the rest of the balance of chapter uh, two in Exodus. So he fled to the land of Midian and became a dweller where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Okay, sneak preview. So here we go, verse 16. He ran from the place of the presence of Pharaoh. Um, verse 16, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled their troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So apparently, and we're going to see in just a minute, this is something that goes on all the time. The girls, the seven daughters of the priest, go out to water the flocks. But then the guys come along and kick them off the well. And the girls have to wait around until the guys are done. And then they get to finish their watering their flocks. But Moses happens to be sitting by that well when all this happens. And he says, that's not right. They were here first. And besides, they're ladies, you know. Let them go. Let them finish their job. So he kind of stood up. He was kind of a hero in this moment. Um, verse 18. When they came to Ruel, their father. So that's their father's name. Ruel, El, always is a, a contraction of Elohim, or God. Ruel means friend of God. This is their father's name. Remember, he is a priest of Midian. Now, there's some interesting things developing in here. Midian is a land, is, is an area in the Arabian Peninsula. So you know you've got Egypt, and then you've got what we know as the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, okay? But then right there is this triangle of land, the Arabian Peninsula, and Midian is in that area. So Moses has run a long way out into the desert, out into the middle of nowhere, by the backside of nowhere, and he runs into this priest of Midian. It's interesting, when you go back to Genesis 25 and uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and look into some of the genealogies, Midian is, a, is one of the offspring of Abraham and Keturah, Abraham's wife after Sarah died. And apparently they had children and they raised those children to know about God, Yahweh God. And here we see now, 400 years later, as these children of Keturah have ventured off, and now they've got their own little land or region, Midian, there in the Arabian Peninsula, there's a priest, a worshiper of God, okay, a friend of God, the priest of Midian. He has these seven daughters. They go out to water, and lo and behold, there's Moses sitting by the well. See how the story's starting to unfold. Rather, you know, the, the rabbis will say there that coincidence is not a kosher word. Okay? 
it, it's, there are no coincidences. It's called providence. God is always going before us and setting up situations. And so providentially, he ends up at this well. Verse 8, when they came to their father, Ruel, their father, he said, how is it you've come so soon today? That's where I get the idea that they must have been able to thwart the other shepherd boys and get their watering done. Wow, you're back really quick. What happened? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, where is he? What is it? Why is it that you've left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And I'm sure he's thinking to the daughters. He's like, really, girls? Hello? There's a man by a well, and he's a nice man, and you left him out there? What are you thinking? I've been taking care of you my whole life. You need to get married. Bring it home. Let's have some dinner. It doesn't say that in there, but I'm sure it must have been there. <laughs> so he said to the daughters, Where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. And she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have become a stranger in a foreign land. And that's what literally Gershom means, is a stranger. So he's a, a, a sojourner, right? He's a pilgrim. That's really what that word stranger means. He's just passing through. Just as he read of Abraham, who looked for a building whose maker was God, right? And, and he recognizes this is just, this isn't my world. I'm on my way to a place that God has promised me. There's a promised land in my future. But nevertheless, he's content to stay here. So he marries this girl, uh, Sipporah. Her name means little bird, kind of cute name. Okay, and she bore a son. His name is Gershom. Um, and in that, uh, it's just that he's, he's a stranger there. So he names his son, I'm not from here, okay? Or I'm, I'm a foreigner. This isn't really who we are. We're just moving on through. As you've seen, it's pretty common to name kids as to who they are. But he recognizes he's, he's expelled. He's a... A refugee, if you will. Um, I don't know, what do you call people that are running from the law? That's not just a refugee, but... A fugitive. Uh, what? Fugitive. A fugitive. He's a fugitive. He, he's on the lam, right? And, uh, and so he has this son, and uh, we're going to get more into that in just a little bit. Verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time. Okay? And that's saying a quite a bit. But there is a thing. It's called the process of time, right? And how often we find ourselves in a circumstance, a situation, and we're praying about a thing, or we're dreaming about a thing, or we're hoping for a thing, or we're enduring a thing, and quite often there's a thing called the process of time. Often it comes into play when we're dealing with tragedy and we're mourning. And a lot of times, what we need to do is grieve with those who are grieving. The last thing they need is a little sermon on, oh, well, just keep your chin up. They're grieving. And they need time to give time a chance to do what it does, okay? And it's, it's a very real part of our walk with the Lord. And so it happened here, in this case, in the process of time, the king of Egypt died, okay? Okay? So the guy who would have been uh, going to execute him, that's no longer a threat. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Okay? As we're keeping track in all of this, and we're going to get this in just a minute, but I'm going to bring it in right now. He was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian and fled Egypt. And it's going to be 40 years that he serves his... Uh, father-in-law, he's content to be with that family for 40 more years on the back of the desert. And I'll get into more of that later. But as we come to the end of chapter 2, it says, verse 24, God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. And he said, are there any 80-year-olds living in the middle of desert that I can use to rescue a nation? <laughs> Okay, 
So it's a, it's a very fun book. The names. The names. God is interested in who you are and, and who he is, what your relationship is to him. And he's got a plan. He's bringing us out. Okay? In the beginning he created. Everything was good. And man came in and messed things up. And we watched it spiral down until it ended in a coffin. But he called my name. And I'm coming out of that grave. Into, out of the darkness and into his glorious day. Amen? Amen. Amen? Father God, we thank you for the book of Exodus. And we're excited to see what we're going to learn from you. Lessons that we pray, Lord, apply to us as we've learned tonight. So many of the issues that we see in the world around us today seem like they were taken right off these pages. Help us to learn from these things, Lord, that we might worship you. And that, Lord, in doing so, we might show you to the rest of the world. They might come to know the hope that we have in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.